Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. I am continuing this series of webinars on a random basis in terms of when, because many of my guests are quite busy now, and it's getting a little harder to get them scheduled. But I do have people in the wings. I will have more guests coming up, so do stay tuned. Um, and tonight, my guest is Michelle Broadhurst, who is from South Africa, and she's going to talk to us about my fascial lines and my fashion, uh, fashion in general, which is fascinating. The more I learn about it, the more I'm uh, totally amazed by it. So I'm going to let Dr. Broadhurst introduce herself, and then we'll get right into her topic. So welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, Wendy. Um, yeah, as Wendy said, I am a, um, I'm a doctor of chiropractic by schooling. Um, I finished school in the early 2000s when the ARC was being built um, in South Africa and then went on to become a human um, acupuncturist and then a chiropractic sports physician. And then I got bored with treating just people and went back to school for animal chiropractic in the US and also received a certification through the University of Tennessee as a canine rehabilitation practitioner. So I wear many, many hats in my world. Um, but one of the things that really interested me from the get go, um, even as a student, was the connection between myofascial pain and the nervous system, as well as what was going on on a structural level. Because I had some amazing mentors way back when who really um, pulled together beautifully the connection between not only the nervous system, but what was going on on a joint level, on a vertebral level, as well as on a myofascial level. And one of the things that I try to stress, especially when I teach, which I'm very fortunate to do quite a bit these, these days, um, is that one of the things we found out fairly recently actually in human medicine, where we've really done a deep dive into myofascial pain is that when looking at neuromuscular skeletal pain, which is almost all encompassing. So it's the nervous system, the skeletal system and the muscular myofascial, if we can call it system, 80% of the pain that people were experiencing between 35 to 80% and higher on the 80% came from a myofascial source which is pretty really? fascinating. Yeah. Um, so, you know, especially in the horse world where we're very, very prone to looking at joints, right? We always yeah. like blocking this, we're blocking that, we're x-raying this, we're doing that. We only now, I would like to say in the last few years of where we started, um, Enrique Schultz and um, them have done a great job at, you know, tracking the myofascial lines. That's very much their, um, their baby and they've done a great job at it. But what we're learning now is that so much in the equine is, is um, the contribution from myofascial pain is absolutely enormous. And once you start to really understand muscle and fascia and the link to the central nervous system, um, as well as the, the link to mechanoreceptors and proprioceptors and the pain pathways, it's like all of a sudden your whole world explodes and you go, oh my goodness, we have been ignoring this thing for such a long time. And it's, it's almost like your little Harry Potter wand. I, you know, already I have two burning questions I want to ask you, but I think I should wait and let you talk a little more. But um, anyway, I, I've already written them down. I'll just keep writing down. Okay. So, so let me give you guys a little bit of an overview about, about muscle and fascia. So we have two kinds of muscle groups. You've got your phasic and your tonic muscles. Um, and so muscle is a little bit like the beef and burger guys. Okay. So it's fairly, when I want to say it's fairly simple, it's not as complicated as fascia is. So if you guys are not vegan, um, if you do eat meat, um, very often, if you get a, um, a roast from the supermarket and you want to stuff it with garlic and, and rosemary, you have to take a really sharp knife to stab through the, the kind of white marbly layer. And so you can put your garlic in and throw it in the oven, right? Now that is fascia. So fascia has so many different properties and it's really a connective tissue network that works as a 3D matrix, almost like a 4D matrix really, but it works like a spider's web. And that's the best way to really talk about it. So fascia has this incredible neural connectivity that goes all the way through to the central nervous system. So 
anytime, if you think about a spider's web, you can never see the spider on the web, almost never. But goodness, if a fly or something lands on that web, along comes a spider and off it takes this little prey. Now, how does it even know that that thing is on the web? And it's because of the neural and the electrical connectivity that goes on with fascia. So anytime that there, if you go and you stub your toe, your baby toe, you will create a catalytic effect all the way through the fascia so that all of a sudden the next day you may have a headache. And that could have been because of the damage that you've done in that baby toe that has changed the entire fascial network. So if we think about horses, particularly performance horses that are athletes and the amount of pressure that we are consistently putting on their nervous system as well as on their neuromuscular skeletal system, we have, we have to talk about the elephant in the room that is the myofascial system. So to give you an idea, the fascial system is creates so many different um, entities in the body. It creates bursas, it creates ligaments, it creates tendons. There's multiple levels of fascia. So we've got our superficial fascia just underneath the skin that is so important for slidage, right? So you'll see as horse practitioners, whatever it is that you do, whether you're a vet or a body worker or a um, you know, if you're teaching, you'll see it all the time that all of a sudden a horse starts to move a little weird. And if you run your fingers down that horse's body, there will be sort of what I call like tethering points. So some of the skin won't move. You almost get this little ripple effect happening on the skin. That is where the fascia is dehydrated due to injury. And we've got adhesions. So now we've got a little bit of a road bump or a speed bump in the fascial system that doesn't allow for that slidage. Now, the minute that that slidage goes away, things start to dehydrate because the fascial system is so important for nutrition and it runs the lymphatic networks. So all of us, <laughs> Wendy, your face. I'm like, I'm like, ding, 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 ding. Right. So we've gone, oh yeah. I mean, I remember doing anatomy in the nineties. I'm not going to give my age away, okay. um, but you know, doing anatomy and, and I was told, pull out all that white sticky stuff. It's just annoying. And let's just get down to the nitty gritty of what we're doing. But now we really are starting to understand. We've got this amazing superficial fascia that has some muscle fibers interlinked with it so that it really has the stability, but also the slidage available. And then we've got our deep fascia that is our epimysium and our epineurotic fascia that creates all of those amazing bridges from the muscle to create attachment points. That's fascia. Um, and, you know, when a muscle contracts, 40, between 30 to 40 percent, there's conflicting evidence of this, but 30 to 40 percent of the contracture occurs in the fascia. So we always were like, oh, everything runs through the tendon, but that's actually not 100 percent true. It actually radiates and it contracts through the fascia itself. So fascia supports, it slides, it allows for nutrition. It's a huge neural and lymphatic pathway. And in Chinese medicine, we have all these different meridians. And one of the ones that is always like completely bamboozled us as acupuncturists is what is triple heater? What is Sanjiao? Like, what is this thing that is like, you know, you can understand gallbladder, heart, pericardium, you know, all of those ones make complete sense. You're like, oh, I've got that. Liver, psh, everyone's a liver in a spleen case. Nailed it. Um, <laughs> But triple heater has always been this like really enigmatic kind of the cousin we never talked about because we didn't understand it. And now what we're realizing is actually the triple heater or the San Zhao is the fascial system. Wow. So now we're really being able to understand how it's actually one of our most important meridians and yeah. it pulls everything together. So, okay. I haven't even started talking about my fascial pain yet, but... No, this is like such an important thing because if you start going into the um the the research itself, it's really, really quite fascinating how if we ignore what's going on in a fascial system, you will never get a return to function that is as good as it could be. Okay, so so um uh, where to start? There's so many <laughs> questions. Um, well, okay. So the first two things I wrote down is there's this thing that I keep running into called stiff person syndrome. Mm. Is that a fascial problem? 
because what the heck is stiff person yeah. syndrome? And all I can well, think of is it's because my other question is Lyme disease, because in a Lyme disease horse, they become so woody and rigid and stiff mm -hmm. in their tissue. I mean, it's, right. I mean, we have a lot of Lyme disease where I live here in Virginia. So right. th those two just pop to mind straight off the. Well, and think about Lyme disease. Lyme disease sits in the synovium right? It sits in the joint capsule. It sits in the synovial fluid. It loves dark environments that have lots of nutrition because that's where it thrives. So it wants blood flow. It wants to be fed. So it sits out there and I'm talking about like non-active Lyme sits in the right. synovial fluid a lot in the synovial tissue. So very opposite, it still sits in joint capsules, which is why they hurt so much. So, and Lyme is super sneaky because yes. you have your active Lyme, which you hit with the doxy, and then you have your almost inert Lyme that is sitting back waiting for the tequila to come out. Yeah. Right? So Lyme is really, really hard to treat, particularly in horses, because in people, we can starve the Lyme. If we just stop giving it any form of carbohydrate or sugar, a lot of the lime dies off on its own because it is fed by sugar and it's fed by, by carbohydrates. Now in horses, we can't stop giving them carbohydrates because they'll die and they'll right. walk like and, and, you know, yeah. so this is the biggest problem. And that's one of the reasons why it's very hard to treat lime in horses is because from a nutritional base, we're feeding that like dormant lime all the time until it's ready to go have a ride yeah it's something there's an insult and it pops back out and that's kind exactly. of stress any kind of stressor and it pops back mm -hmm. out if you will yes and so anytime that there's injury to anything so you know that lime being in in the synovial fluid or in the joint capsule or in you know any of those places is going to create a catalytic reaction because a parasite can go and sit there but it doesn't doesn't mean it's, it's still an unwanted guest. So anytime that you have a an inflammatory phase with Lyme, inflammation in itself creates the change in the pain cascade. Right. Because of TNFA and interleukins. And I mean, I can. I yeah, yeah, yeah. We could, we could get really nerdy here. <laughs> right. But all of these inflammatory processes and the interesting thing here, and this is something else that's going to really blow you guys away is, you know, we talk about osteoarthritis or degenerative joint disease, right? Now, what's really very, very fascinating for me is that when we're looking at gut health and we're looking at things like looking at our precursors for things like degenerative joint disease, they have the same inflammatory precursors. So there is a very, very, very large link between inflammation of any sort in the body and changes within the neuromuscular skeletal system. So we could be talking uh, things like autoimmune diseases as well as anything. Uh, Wow. And we all know now that everything starts in the gut, right? right. So if the gut isn't right, nothing is right. And this is exactly why. So when we're looking at things like lipopolysaccharides, which is basically what creates um, IBS or your inflammatory bowel diseases and all of these different things. So you get these craters occurring through the actual um the actual gut tissue that allows all of these dysbiotic bacteria to go through that lining into the system. And interestingly enough, it travels via the vagus nerve. Now, most people know about the vagus nerve and we know why, like, and have you ever thought about the link between, and now we're going off down a whole other rabbit hole. Yeah, I was going to say, there's a lot of rabbit holes out here. Okay. <laughs> the link between pain when, when cinching up a girth, right? And ulcers are found very similarly if you're looking for ulcers and things like that. And it, it tracks along the vagus nerve. And it's because of the inflammatory processes that are happening that use the vagus nerve as a train station to the brain. Wow. So the, so Vegas becomes a highway for uh, uh, Ill, uh, inflammation. Right. Okay. Yeah. For stuff that stuff that's invaded and it's like, yay, you built me a highway. So I'm just going to use that highway and run up to the brain and then oops. Now, and let's talk about chronic pain for a moment. So um, 
there's something that I, I teach on the nervous system a lot. And it, I really, I'm not an, it took me a long time to like really fathom this because when I was at school, nervous system was really scary. It was lots of words and lots of pathways and it just got super scary. But what's really interesting for me is that there is an area of your brain called the anterior cingulate cortex. And it's where the periaqueductal gray matter kind of like hangs out a lot. So it's very kind of interlinked with the periaqueductal gray matter. Now, what's really fascinating about this is that that anterior cingulate cortex, that portion of the brain is the same area that interprets chronic pain that also gives you emotion. So when you are looking at horses changing behavior and you know everybody's like, oh, he's so naughty, but he never used to be naughty. Well, that's because more than likely we have a chronic pain pathway that is changing the neural processes in the anterior cingular cortex because those two areas hold hands. They, well, the, that one area holds hands with two different functions. So it's a chronic pain receiver. And it's also the one that interprets and gives off emotion all the time. So, so we're, we probably haven't, but it sounds like we're diverging from fascia, but of course the nervous system is something I'm so fascinated. All part of it. Right. And, um, you know, I, I don't know if you've ever heard of David Butler at the university mm -hmm. of Sydney. Um, I took a workshop with him and I recommend his book all the time because I, I found him to be one of the most fascinating people to explain pain in people. Mm -hmm. um, and this was years ago and I still talk about, I recommend it to a lot of people. So what's the fascial connection into the nervous system pain response then? Okay, so fascia is, um, okay, let me explain this the best that I can without taking up an hour and 15 minutes of your time. Okay, so if you're looking at fascia, super neurological, very like lots of these pathways, think spider web, okay? Like all these different little strands coming together to create these neural pathways. Full of mechanoreceptors, which means that they are responsible for feeling pressure, touch, things like that. Um, and then you got your proprioceptors, right? And your proprioceptors that sit in this fascia, which are like, if you can imagine just like, fireworks going off, that's mechanoreceptors and proprioceptors in your fascia. So anything that changes on a temperature level, anything that changes on a touch, pressure, pain level gets transmitted through the fascia, through the nervous system, and then we get our efferent responses. So what that means is your highway of pain in a lot of cases, and I'm, I'm not excluding obviously individual neural pain and things like that and joint pain, but it is the one that is your transmission source. It's your highway between your central nervous system, your peripheral nervous system, and all of these interlinking branches. So if you have a speed bump in your fascial system, you have a, I always go back to Denver roads, right? Denver has terrible roads because half the year it's hot and the other half it's freezing. So we get all of these massive potholes. So think of it as a, as a pothole in your, in your highway. It's never smooth sailing. So there's always gonna be damage at that area and it's going to create a ripple effect into the tissue surrounding it, as well as the joint that it's supposed to protect and support. And so it affects movement, it affects biomechanics, it affects everything. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna throw this in here. So is there fascia, fascia lining the gut, but not in the gut? Cause you've got the mucosa of the gut, right? You've got the, yes. the uh, villi, right? So yes. is the fascia sur surrounding the gut? And so like when you have inflammation in your gut and IBS, then you're affecting the fascia, which is now sending super highway message up to your brain and it's going danger, danger, and we're not happy. Exactly. So remember that like the different cavities even of the body are created by fascia. Right. And that's right. why they don't get all sticky together, right? Right. And, and all the same. organs have layers to keep it correct so we, yes. that's why it's so interesting because it's so multi-layered 
So we have all of these different fascial lines, well, fascial um, levels, if we want to call it that. And then, of course, we've got the fascia that covers the pelvic floor, that goes through the gut. You know, it's all part of it. And so if you have healthy organs and you have a healthy tissue, then we're not getting the adhesions um, within the fascia because you've got almost like we call them myofascial trigger points, right? But muscle reacts slightly different to fascia. So you get almost like more of a fascial adhesion and muscles get more in the way. And I call them myofascial trigger points because they are, they mix together. You can't separate them, which is why you have to stab through your roast to get to do what you need to do because you can't take that fascia off. So when there's disability in the fascia, it's going to affect the entire contractibility and functionality of the muscle itself because the two are kissing cousins. Right. Yes. Okay. Question. Okay. So um, uh, uh, let me just see if anybody's got a question. <laughs> Has there been research done on fascia that proves that fascial communication is electrical like the nervous system? Yes, ma'am. I can send you a couple of papers that... Um, after this and you can send it put it out on your facebook page if you want or something along those lines um yes there is so there's they've actually done it via various different forms um and if you look at things on a histo um, pathology level it it just they they've got all of that there so so what okay there's i just we could go on for many hours but to keep this into one conversation yes. um I've, I've had another person come in and talk about fascia and she talks about fascia as being like, like, I'm going to go back to embryology, like from the moment that you fertilize, fascia is actually developing between the cells. Absolutely. So, so it is our earliest connective structure. Mm -hmm. Okay. hundred percent. So as, uh, that embryo is forming, then this connective tissue structure is forming and is it fair to say that that's actually the precursor to the skeletal system because it creates uh, a, a connection between that because bone is also covered in fascia, right? Yes. Periosteum. Yeah, with periosteum. Exactly. So, so yes, it is. Um, it's and you've got to remember too that fascia surrounds every nerve. It all of the vessels are almost what do you think holds the blood in the vein yeah fascia so what percentage of fascia is in your brain that is a fantastic question wendy i do not know yeah because when you think about it if okay so you've got this forming and you're going to start making that nervous system and clearly there's got to be fascia because my you know all the cranial sacral and everything all that kind of work but you know there's so much about the brain matter that, you know, I haven't kept up with it, but I know that we don't understand. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a great question. I, I couldn't answer that. And I couldn't even take a stab in the dark to, to try to tell you that. Right. Um, I think, I think the way you have to look at fascia is it is the, it's the bouncer at the nightclub. It's the, um, it's the mom feeding the kids. It has it wears so many different hats, which is why it's so complicated. So it's such an important thing for nutrition. It's such an important thing for the nervous system, for the lymphatic system. It creates structure. It allows for slidage. It gives support. It does all these things. It separates things. So it had. it's not as easy as going, okay, so this is what an artery does because it doesn't matter where the artery is, it still has the same job, right. theoretically, right? Right. Whereas, and like lymphatics to a certain degree are also fairly simple. Like it's supposed to absorb toxins, get rid of waste, you know, clean out. It's the, it's the garbage man of the body to a certain degree. Um, but when we start looking at fascia, it's not that simple. And that's why it's such an important to, thing to look at in the equine athlete. Or in the equine patient, because we look at things like suspensories, right? Now, if you think about it, suspensory is fascial based. So if we have a bad, when do we blow suspensories the most? If we have bad footing, if we have incorrect um, feet, shape, size, angles, all of that, and it's fairly unforgiving. But now, are we really 
and this is something I talk about a lot with my clients, is the problem really with the suspensory or is it because of an underlying problem somewhere else that we have not addressed? So now we're getting a tug on the fascial system, on the suspensories, which don't have as much give as a muscle, right? Because they're fascial. So they don't stretch like lycra. They're more like a cotton, okay? So if you can only stretch cotton so far until you break it and it tears, okay? Lycra, you can kind of, you can twist it, you can spin it. You've got a lot more play in that in that structure than what you'll have in a, in a t- cotton T-shirt. Right. So ligaments and tendons are built to support and and also absorb a lot of, of stress. Right. They're the they're the stress carriers. Now, if you have an issue going on, let's take a suspensory. If you have a problem in the hock, let's say, or you've got a super tight hamstring or your glutes are not activating or you're overloading your um, apaxial, your paraspinal muscles, all of a sudden you're going to change that biomechanical chain all the way down to the area that doesn't doesn't move the most. Right. Okay. Yep. So and that's fascia. And it's so the what is going on higher up or even lower down is going to affect what is happening at that position. And it's not fair to say, oh, you know, suspensories, it must be, you know, they're just not, they're just not strong or they're not. No, it's an overuse injury, but the overuse is not necessarily on the suspensory. It's the thing that gives. Well, and I've always looked at it as also is if you fatigue the muscle supporting the suspensory, then you're, then the muscle can't do the job of maintaining. And now you're really putting it into the fascial ligament tendon system that right. can't handle it. And you see, that's where my fascial trigger points come in. And that's what makes them so interesting. And that's what the book is all about, right? And the course. Okay, so, uh, oh, wait, before I lose this question. Mm. Oh, you talk about dehydration and fascia. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? So when an area is injured in the fascial system, okay, um, you start getting adhesions. So any form of injury is going to deposit scar tissue and scar tissue is actually a form of fascia, ironically. But the fascia or the connective tissue that is going to be placed down is not necessarily good tissue, okay? So you've got your type two collagens versus your type one collagens and I can go into this more, but this is not the the place to do that. So when you're putting down collagen and you're putting down scar tissue, you need that scar tissue to um, reform to be healthy tissue. But in a lot of cases, we don't work that scar tissue effectively. So what happens is the ability to, as we were talking about move and separate, which is what fascia's job is, the minute that you have an adhesion, these fascia on a super, well, let's just talk about superficial fascia. The superficial fascia is going to adhere to the skin and it can also adhere to the muscle if it's been injured. So it gets tacky, like chewing gum. So it does this effect where they were all individual layers at one, and I'm, I'm simplifying this, but Fine. also individual layers that were all doing this and were cruising along nicely. Now, all of a sudden you have this. Okay. And they've compacted. So now we don't, we're not able to get the lymphatic flow and the blood flow to that area because they've sucked together. Okay. So until you actually change that adhesion and you get rid of that adhesion, you're going to have that tethering point that I was talking about earlier. Right. And so when you have this tethering, what starts to happen is you start getting more of an inflammatory response. And you start getting a pain response in that area because now you're still asking the body to do the same biomechanics as it was doing before, but now it doesn't have the ability to slide and move and support and separate and all those things because it's sucked together. Okay. So that's exactly comes back to my, my knocking your toe analogy, right? Now you've got a tethering point at one point. So now the rest of the body has to accommodate to what is going on here. And so then you start getting changes, 
somewhere else and somewhere else and somewhere else. And so the entire biomechanics of the horse starts to change. So when we talk about nutrition, we're talking about blood flow, nerve flow, um, and lymphatic flow that goes to allow the nutrients because it's almost like dehydrating a sponge. When fascia gets injured, it loses its ability to hold water because remember, we've got a whole bunch of hyaluronic acid in there and hyaluronic acid is super turgic, so it absorbs water and it allows for it to be squishy and squishy things move. So when you don't have, when we damage that fascia, we lose all of those bonding and binding properties and we create scar tissue, which is very non, um, what's the word? It doesn't give. Right. So now we're not able to have the fluidity that we had before. So, so it's, it's, if I can put this together, it's when you have an adhesion, you lose the fluid flow that keeps everything gliding. And therefore it's pretty much, it loses its hydration. And that's, and that, and is that then why we see sort of these, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, kind of like puckery places. Puckerings. Exactly. That's exactly what I call it. So it looks like somebody's created a ripple effect. And I often do this with, with patients. I'm like, okay, look here. And I'll move to a different area of the, of the body. And I'll be like, look here, how beautifully this separates. And you'll go over that spot and it's just stuck. Right. So think about it logically. If you have fashion muscle that is not moving effectively, what's going to happen to the joints underneath? So we see this a ton around the withers area. We see this a lot around um, the shoulder in particular, and if you're thinking about race horses or you're looking at um, at quarter horses that are like reining or or, or doing um, cow work, they're very overdeveloped on the fore, right? And they're very heavy on their forelimb. And we know that the driving force is in the hind limb. So, you know, head follows hind. But if they're being ridden he really heavily on the fore, their body is not able to adapt to that. So um atp is a big thing that comes into myofascial trigger points so adenosine triphosphate is really important for both the contracture and the release of of muscle so it when we're looking at myofascial trigger points what's super interesting about that is and i can go into the whole mechanism of how a myofascial trigger point happens so basically any time that there is damage there is a change in the sarcomeres all right which is the basically the way that the, the tissue binds together. And there's a calcium pump that takes calcium away from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So anytime there's damage in a muscle, the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the sarcolemma allows for too much calcium to come into this area. And the calcium pump is ATP reliant. So it's meant to have all this energy to take the calcium out. But because we've got too much calcium, it causes too much um, contracture of the tissue. Okay. And then we've got a whole bunch of other things, which I can tell from your face, you don't really want me to go into. But anyway, when we don't, when we get this contraction, we've got acetylcholine that comes to the party, substance P, um, calcitonin gene related peptides all this cool stuff that is not so cool when you have an injury because it facilitates the junction and the contracture of this tissue and because we don't have atp it can't let go because the atp has been exhausted by this constant contracture occurring and then it halts and that's a trigger point wow okay so, and I'm, I'm simplifying this, I know. Bit, but what's so cool about that is that we have, we can really change that very quickly. So trigger points and something that you need to remember about trigger points is that they're very, very distinctive and they're very different from myalgia, which is basically generalized muscle pain. So we go back to the gym after COVID and we can't walk down the stairs for like a couple of days, that is more like generalized muscle pain than a myofascial trigger point. So a myofascial trigger point, which occurs, 
you know, fascial adhesions, myofascial trigger points all together because one affects the other. What starts to happen is you get some characteristic things. And this would really help you guys in practice to know whether you're dealing with a general muscle soreness or a spasm versus a trigger point. So one of the biggest things that that is a pathognomonic is a local twitch response. So when you put your thumb or whatever you're using on a trigger point, you will actually see a twitch through the muscle fibers. And that's an active trigger point, not a latent trigger point. And there's two different kinds. So the active trigger point has both a local pain response. So in concentrated to that area, but it also has a referred pain. So if I have a trigger point in my trapezius muscle, if somebody sticks a finger or a needle in here, it may refer all the way up to the back of my neck and give me a headache. And that's what an active trigger point will do. It'll create a pain outside of its localized area and somewhere fairly distant from that point. And that's what a trigger point is. So the other thing that is really pathognomonic about trigger points is that they create weakness without atrophy. And that is very important to remember. So when you have an injury that is associated with weakness and atrophy, that is either a chronic pain syndrome or it is a chronic condition because it's taken time for that muscle to atrophy. But very often you'll just see a horse lose a step or you'll see them drop a shoulder and it's not rider dependent. And you're like, oh, that's interesting. That's a little bit of weakness. And it'll be on a certain movement in a certain position and it'll come up. But it, the muscle itself doesn't degrade. So you're not going to see atrophy of the muscle unless it becomes a disuse injury. Okay. Does that make sense? I, yep. I'm, I follow that. Okay. And the beautiful part about that is the minute you treat that trigger point and that trigger point is eradicated, no more weakness immediately. So is the weakness a function of this neural pathway? Right. The ATP can't get in to release the calcium dependent or is that different? Well, it's a little different. So now we've already got this trigger point. That's our roadblock, right? It's okay. our little bump in the road. So now what it's doing is it's changing the, D, the ascending and descending pain pathway. Okay. So that you're getting you your reciprocal inhibition changes. So for those of you that don't know what reciprocal inhibition is, is it's if you have a tricep and a bicep, okay? When the bicep is active, the tricep is relaxed because if they were both going to be active together, all you would have is like a completely stiff joint that was fighting against each other, okay? So in order for an, an the biomechanics to be effective, while one is acting, the other isn't. So when you have trigger points, it upsets the reciprocal inhibition. So it changes biomechanics because the neural pathway is being affected. Okay. This is start. Yeah. So um it's it's very cool once you once you can kind of grasp your get your head around it a little bit. And the other thing that trigger points do that is very pathognomonic is it creates central sensitization or peripheral sensitization. Now, what that means in the neural world is that something is much is perceived as being much more painful than it should be by the central nervous system. So that's why I kind of went down a little rabbit hole with the anterior cingulate cortex, because again, if we don't treat these pain points or these adhered or trigger point or fascial adhesions, whatever you want to call it, this now becomes a chronic pain pathway. Okay. So we start seeing not only changes in biomechanics, but we start seeing changes in character. Right. Behavior. So, so we've got a couple of questions here. Um, let's see. Is it possible that when the fascia is tight, restricted, that it is supporting some underlying pathology or injury? And when we rehydrate or loosen the fascia, it can reveal something previously hidden, previously hidden injury. That's a fantastic question. Absolutely. So remembering that, you know, part of the, the fascial pathway is to create scar tissue. So yes, once you let that go, and what you're going to find is it's a little bit um, like peeling an onion. 
is you take away the one, and, and this is what I was talking about, tethering points, right? So you've got this, this, this tight connection somewhere and the, you take that away and all of a sudden something else pops up and then something else pops up. So as you're getting rid of these different layers, you're actually doing what we should be doing as practitioners, which is getting to the root of the cause, right. um, as opposed to always band-aiding that thing, right? Like, oh, let's just, and I'm, I'm not saying that there isn't a place for this, but like, oh, let's just inject it. It'll be fine. So, yeah. so no, that's a very good point. So, you know, a lot of the symptomatology that you're seeing may be at a, a fifth level or a 10th level or a second level, but very often by the time, because you've got to remember that horses are, they are our herd animals. They are fight and flight. They know that they're being hunted all the time. So the slowest guy or the illest guy is going to die in the wild. That's just how it is, right? So they hide pain remarkably and they will compensate at such a high level before they'll even become symptomatic. You know, I often say that people do the same thing because I see that all the time in my riders is that the we're masters at, because we don't want to appear vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> my arm's yeah. falling off, but I'm fine. Yeah. I'll just use the other one. It'll be fine. I know, it's you like know. a Monty Python joke, right? It's like, yeah, I mean, the uh, the only difference between us, well, not only difference, there's so many differences, but a big difference between us and animals is that we they don't have placebo. Right. So, you know, when it gets to a point of, and that's how in answer to very long-winded way of answering your question, is once you release that area that is so tight that is protecting something else, something else may become revealed. And slowly you may actually see the animal start changing shape or um, how they move or how they act and all those sorts of things. So it really is, I'll give you a perfect example. On Monday, I was treating this really high um, level horse and I was like, oh my gosh, this horse has like 16 tethering points that we need to work through until, and I, I'm I'm lucky that I'm at a level that I can identify that and go, okay, work this, work this, work this, let's do this. Um, but if we just keep treating the symptom, we never really get to the cause. Right. No, I totally agree with that. Um, we have another question. Is the hyoid tongue hyoid connected all the way back to the hind end via fascia? Is there a peer-reviewed research to that effect? Um, that's also a great question. Yes, there is definitely a connection. And you're going to ask me who did the paper. And I'm not going to be able to tell you because it's 6 p.m. my time. Um, <laughs> but there is a paper. And yes, there is, there is absolutely a connection between the hyoid and the multiple hyoid muscles that show the link all the way almost to the to the hind end. Okay. And... Um, and so the other question here is, how is a trigger point treated? Oh, oh. <laughs> go off to my own heart. Oh, boy. Um, okay. So um, how long is a piece of string? Um, it really, it's really preference dependent. So one of the most important things is getting rid of the twitch response, right? Which creates an active trigger point. So you want to create a catalyst within that trigger point. So now remember, it's almost like become this encapsulated mess of tissue that won't let go because it's now protecting itself. So there's multiple ways. Um, you can use trigger point therapy, which could just be using your fingers, using a um, fascial release tool, um, using a needle, shockwave, laser, massage. Um, certain movements can actually release that trigger point. Um, but you've got to create a catalyst so that the body can get there and actually treat what it needs to treat. So when a trigger point has been there for a long time, the body accommodates, as we were talking about, it compensates and it goes, okay, I don't have time to worry about that. So it just kind of encapsulates it and, and, and stores it away. So you almost have to create a situation of micro trauma that is going to bring inflammation to that area. And I'm not talking about like hitting them with a crop. Um, you actually want to pinpoint it. So there's a little homing beacon 
at a specific point so the body knows where to send all of this good stuff including vascularity that is going to then change and reduce that trigger point so there are that is a whole other lecture um but just so you know there are multiple ways and you can do it in a variety of different ways um and you don't have to have a surgical degree to do it um but you have to create a catalyst so so do you think then that a lot of the therapies that are being used in a lot of the different techniques massage t-touch surfoot pads all all of those are in are in their own way addressing this from a different pers- from from their own perspectives i mean because if the fascia is everywhere sometimes sometimes we can be a co-conspirator so and what i mean by that is if you are it, it it is very practitioner dependent so if you really understand and this is one of the things that that the new course is going to be really addressing is understanding pain and understanding pathways because until you really understand the pain pathway and how everything kind of works together, um, you can be aiding and abetting. So let's take, for example, uh, you have a super tight hamstring, okay? So the horse is like, oh my gosh, that's semi-tendinosis, you could bounce a penny off it. Um, why is it so tight? And that's something we don't always look for. So you could go in there and massage the daylights out of the semitendinosis, which means that now it's become um, tissue that is not, that is not firing on all cylinders because we have released all of this hypertonicity, right? But what if we have something going on in that is really a hundred times much worse that that semitendinosis is actually protecting? So a lot of the time when we're just treating what we find without looking for the cause, we could be doing good, but we could also be doing harm. So a lot of the time, if that semitendinosis is super, super tight and it's almost like a muscle spasm, look for something either in an antagonist or an agonist. So those are the muscles that either play with that muscle or do the opposite of that muscle. Because very often it's going to be compensating for something else if it's a consistent thing. So let's say you loosen up that hamstring and then the rider decides it wants to do some work, but we've now created an instability or we've opened up this can of worms that we haven't addressed the the cause with, that could do more damage or it could be super helpful. But my point is always you want to get to the root cause before have a diagnosis before you start treating because if your diagnosis is the semitendinosis is tight that's a symptom that's not a diagnosis and i'm not telling you to diagnose but i'm saying create your picture because it's never one thing well, I think what you're saying is it's not that simple. You have to look at the whole animal to see yeah. if, if you find an area of hypertonicity, why is that area so high and who isn't playing? Um, Correct. And so when I teach riders, when I teach other riding instructors, I always say, you know, your eye is drawn to what's moving, but the question is what's not moving. And that's not where our eye is drawn. Exactly. Right. It's like a slice of a hand, right? Right. So look here. I'm I'm super damaged. Look here. This is great. Hi. Exactly. So so I think I, I think and again, this is something that we can talk about for hours and hours and hours because it's absolutely fascinating. And to me, it's the most important part of the horse. Like joints you can always treat. Like I, if you ask me what I'd prefer to break, I would or, or damage, I prefer to break a bone then hurt my, my neuromuscular skeletal system, like my fascial system, right. because that's going to take so much longer for me to heal. So, um, so do you find that since the emotion that the, the part of the brain that is over there sensing pain and has emotion that when you are treating a trigger point over here, that you may have an emotion show up because of this treatment? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, and, and 
the little bit that I know about MFR and I've done a course in it and and whatnot, like that's the whole unravel, I want to say unraveling process, but I think there's another word for it that they talk about in myofascial yeah, release. Define MFR. Myofascial release, you okay. know. Where you, so people who aren't familiar. Yeah. yeah, the soft touch and they get this whole unraveling process and that's because it's changing on a neural level in the, my, my concept of it, don't, this is not, biblical um yeah is is you're changing the neuroplasticity of the tissue right and so when the neuroplasticity changes you're dealing with again proprioceptives mechanoreceptors you're dealing with that whole highway and so things are changing at the thalamus and at the um rvm and in the periaqueductal gray matter and so it's changing on multiple levels that is creating a catalytic response so somebody's asking, is there a certain order that you treat trigger points, assuming that you have many of them? You always want to treat the active trigger points because latent trigger points can become active, but active can never become latent. So um, that is also a conversation for another day. And I don't mean to blow you off on this. But oh, no, I, no, no. I mean, that's what I'm asking you the question. I, they put it in the chat, but I realize yeah. these are not simple questions, actually. They're not simple questions. So, so <laughs> In response to that, I think that's where it comes into a multifactorial um, treatment approach. So you want to look at biomechanics. So you want to first see where the lack of movement is happening. Where's the imbalance? What's how is that? How are they carrying themselves? Um, and then you want to look for symmetry because asymmetry is going to tell us a whole different story about compensation. And then you really want to nail it down to knowing your muscle groups. And because remember, fascia and muscle are very well interacted is if we're getting a restriction and extension on the shoulder, what muscles are involved, that's going to help you kind of target down where your, where your most active symptom is. And I would start at your most active symptom and then peel the onion. So so, so I think the simple way to say that is it depends. <laughs> yeah, I think I've been saying that the whole way through this this webinar, but it does depend. But but it's multi, it's many moving parts. So just try to almost like blank your mind out, and which I'm very good at because I'm not that smart. But um, blank your mind out and watch the horse and what is jumping out at you. And you go, okay, I'm going to start there because if you have multiple things, you can't treat them all at once. Otherwise, they're going to fall apart. And that's something you need to know too. You can't take away all these compensations in one go. Otherwise, they break. Yeah. So that's something you definitely need to pay attention to. I think I think what you're saying, and I, I think this is true with all the modalities, is that, you know, it's just because you can doesn't mean you should. Yes. Exactly. You've got to really look at the whole environment, what this horse's job is, what he's been doing, what he's going to go back to doing, what, you know, what the diagnosis is. Have you called in a vet? Have you, ha you know, do you have the team looking at this horse, especially exactly. with these upper level horses? You've got to involve that whole team because you could do one little thing and the next thing that horse isn't going to that competition. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, you, you know, that's an answer to your question. You can create more lameness by treating too much. So it's a very, very delicate balance. So tell and, us a little bit. I know you have to go shortly. Yeah. <laughs> tell us a little bit about the course that you're you're doing. So uh, we've just got it race approved, um, which is great. We're going to do, uh, it's a large animal myofascial course where we're going to be talking about all things my muscle and fascial and the nervous system and the pain responses and how each modality could be really helpful in treating those things so we go through dry needling we go through um everything from shockwave to laser to oh my gosh we've got so and many this is for veterinarians things. it is for anybody really um that is interested in looking at the myofascial system particularly in horses so it's on my website at the moment it's going to be moving across into a kajabi site but if you're interested it's actually we're just launching it We've just launched it actually this week and it's a beta test. Um, so it's at a half the price, almost a third of the prices is going to be. So um, yeah, if you're interested in this, www. The, the, uh, yeah. the URL in the chat. Sure. Uh, 
you know, somebody's asking how much you treat at a time. I, but I really think that that's a case by case, uh, you know, it's basis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Um, and I know you have to go. And so I'm, I've been watching our time for you. Um, yeah, thank you. So, but it's really important. So, okay. So if we were to just, we got th two minutes left. Yes. If, if you were to just encapsulate like your perception of the fact, how would you describe the fascial system at this point in time? I think the fascial system is the mo possibly one of the most important things in anybody um, whether it's a horse, a dog, a person, um, and it's completely under misunderstood. And it is the, I think it is the glue that, that holds everything together and allows everything to work as it should. And if there's one thing that people could do to keep their fascial system as healthy as possible, what would it be? Stretch a lot. Um, change the way that you move on a repetitive basis so that you don't always move the same way. Um, drink lots of water, avoid sugars, um, don't eat crap, and and m focus on your gut health. Um, because the lower your inflammatory level is, the better your body's gonna be, and the less it has to deal with all these inflammatory precursors that go everywhere and create havoc. So, so essentially, and this is something that keeps coming up over and over again, the health of your gut is really the key to your health. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Wow. Well, uh, this has been absolutely fascinating and brings up a lot more questions than it <laughs> actually answers. Cause, um, uh, just, we could go in so many different directions. <laughs> I know. So, um, but this is awesome. I really appreciate your time and don't be surprised if I come back and ask you for another webinar fairly soon. It's the greatest of pleasure. I hope that uh, at least some, you guys got to take away a little bit of something. Yeah, and we'll we'll um we'll continue that conversation. So thank you so much for joining me. You're welcome, thank you everybody. And this will get posted on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel, uh, along with the other three hundred plus webinars that are out there available to everybody. So thanks a lot. Have a great so, night. Thanks again. Take care. Bye. Bye.